بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أما بعد Moving on to the next point Al-Hafiz bin Hajar رحيم الله تعالى He says When روى عن اثنين متفقي الاسم ولم يتميز فباختصاصه بأحدهما يتبين المهمل He moves on to the next point which is regarding the Isnad and the narrators who are found therein. And he gives you a scenario or a situation. He says, When rawa anithnaini, if there is a person, whether it is a hadith compiler or a sheikh, a rawi, and he reports from two people, anithnaini, two sheikhs, mutafiqayil ism, who both have the same first name. Who both have the same first name. We can't determine who they are. It isn't clear which one of the two is more than one narrated with this name, this first name. So with regards to this narrator and his connection or relation with this sheikh, time, place, who's before him, who's after him, etc., يَتَبَيَّنَ muhmal. Then it becomes clear who this uh, vaguely mentioned person is. This person who's called al-muhmal, as we have taken uh, previously. Al-muhmal, we have mubham, someone who's not even mentioned. A rajul, a man told me. That's mubham. Imra'a, a woman. And then we have muhmal. Someone whose name is mentioned, but the name isn't mentioned with an adequate and sufficient amount of information of us to know who it is. Such as he says, Hadathani Muhammad. Muhammad told me. Hadathani Bakr. Especially, or well, the problem is, especially uh, uh, you know, any complex when there are several different Muhammads or Bakrs or Ismail's or Ahmed's, 20, 50, 100 narrators by that name. And then it becomes even more difficult and complex when a person has more than one teacher with the first name. Several teachers are Muhammad. Hmm? So he says, we know this through uh, the sheikh and the, the one who uh, he narrates from and who is the student, etc. So Imam al-Bukhari, Hafid bin Hajar, he mentions many examples of this. Uh, such as when he narrates from someone who is Ahmed. Alright. Ahmed ibn Wahab. Ahmed ibn Salih. Ahmed ibn Isa. Okay. Uh, and then he talks about Muhammad. If his sheikh is named Muhammad. And the sheikh Muhammad is narrated from someone from Iraq. From Iraq. Then it's Muhammad ibn Salam. Or Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Zuhli etc. In other words, we know from the Tilmid and from the Sheikh who is the next person in the chain. Is it someone Kufi, someone Shami? Huh? Wahakada. Wahakada. From the Tabi'in, Wahakada. Khayran, inshallah ta'ala. Moving forward. Huwa in jahda marwiyahu jazman rudd aw ihtimalan qubila fil asah wa fihi man hadatha wa nasi. The next point is regarding when a sheikh gives a student a narration and then all of a sudden after some time the sheikh says, whoa, I never told him that. He never got that narration from me. That isn't from me. That's not my narration at all. If he says this, the author says, Jasmine, decisively, strongly, he says, Rudda, then it cannot be taken. It cannot be taken. We can't take it. Regardless whether the sheikh just says that it isn't his or whether he actually calls the student an actual liar. Doesn't matter. As long as it's jazm, Ibn Hajar Ta'ala says, can't be accepted. Or it's possibility. He says, I really don't remember that. I can't recall that. I'm not sure that I told him that. I don't. When was this? It's not jazm. It's not decisiveness. He says, He says, In the correct view, 
is that this narration should be accepted. The correct view is that this narration should be accepted. Hmm? There's difference of opinion. Some say that it shouldn't be accepted at all. One of the reasons why it is to be accepted is because if the narrator, the student that took from the sheikh, he's trustworthy, he has adala, he's thiqa, he's dabit, he's adil. We can't just call someone who's a trustworthy person to be a liar, who's actually trustworthy, and not someone who's presupposed or who you think is actual uh, precise, trustworthy narrator. Okay? And there has no definite proof that he made a mistake or an error, except for the lack of memory of this sheikh, who in most cases, or in many cases, has become old and senile. He's not 100% old and senile where he's mutagayir or muqtalat, but he's older. It was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, I remember. So, that's one thing. He says, وَفِيهِ مَنْ حَدَّثَ وَنَسِي And in this regard, this science of hadith is that which is called مَنْ حَدَّثَ وَنَسِي As we've taken before from a tadhkira نعم? Hmm? We know that uh, there were scholars who wrote books on the subject, such as Adar al-Khutni, rahimahullah ta'ala, and others. Tight, moving forward. He says, وَإِنْ اتَّفَقُ الرُّوَاتُ فِي سِيغِ الْأَدَاءِ أَوْ غَيْرِهَا مِنَ الْحَالَاتِ فَهُوَ الْمُسَلْسَلِ As far as when the narrators agree on how they report the hadith, how they heard it, how they saw it, how it came to them. He says, أَوْ غَيْرِهَا مِنَ الْحَالَاتِ Or any other similarity. They all stood up, they all sat down, they all smiled, they all put their right arms their right hands on the uh, the left shoulders of their pupils, etc. They put their hand on their pupils' palm. They did something, and each narrator passed it on. The sheikh to the student, the student to the sh- his student, etc. They all did the same thing. They did the exact same position, or whatever the case may be. He says, and this is called al musalsal. Then this is called al musalsal, and we previously mentioned this in al baykuniya and we previously explained this in our sharh of a tafkira. Al Musalsal. And we mentioned the benefits of the Musalsal and the harms, or not the harms, but the word that I'm trying to look for, the problems that come with Al Musalsal. Because it is such a subtlety and such a rarity that many people who are weak look for it. And many people they they search and they covet for this type of hadith. And sometimes they may become a bit laxed regarding its authenticity. Regarding its authenticity. Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. Moving forward. After he spoke on the seal, plural of seal, the way that a person gets a hadith, he mentions what types of seal there are. Just like we took in Bequni and Tadkir as well. He says, وصيغ الأداء سمعت وحدثني ثم أخبرني وقرأت عليه ثم قري عليه وأنا أسمع ثم أنبأني ثم ناولني ثم شافهني ثم كتب إلي ثم عن ونحوها فالأولان لمن سمع وحده من لفظ الشيخ فانجمع فمع غيره وأولها أصرهها وأرفعها في الإملاء والثالث والرابع لمن قرأ بنفسه فانجمع فك الخامس والانباء بمعنى الإخبار إلا في عرف المتأخرين فهو للإجازة كعن He then says that the سيغ plural of سيغ once more the ways in which the student gets the hadith from the sheikh are as follows number one he says سمعت which means I heard I heard, meaning you say, when you report to your student, you say, I heard from my teacher, my sheikh, I heard from him. After that is, وَحَدَثَنِي My teacher reported to me, حَدَّث He gave me a hadith. Then we have, أَخْبَرَنِي He related to me. Then we have, قَرَأْتُ عَلَيْهِ I read to him, meaning you read to him his hadiths. You read to him his hadiths. He gave you his notes. He gave you his book of hadiths. 
and you read them to him, regardless whether he gives you ijazah to report them or not, but you read them to him. ثُمَّ قُرِيَ عَلَيْهِ وَأَنَا أَسْمَعَ After that is, someone else was reading to him and I was listening. There was another student reading to him and I was there listening. ثُمَّ أَنْبَأَنِي Then we have أَنْبَأَنِي which has a very similar synonymous meaning in English to the previous meanings, but it's a bit different in Arabic. An example, يعني, if you say Al-Ikhbar, in English means to give someone khabar, to give someone a report, snooze. And you say Amba'ni, give someone Amba'a. Huh? Uh, Amma yatasa'alun uh, anil nabi al-azim, the great news. So, linguistically, it's similar, synonymous, but in Ilm al-Hadith, according to some scholars and certain scholars, it's a bit different. And Ba' is a bit different than Ikhbar and Tahdith, etc. He says, after that, Nawalani, that he made Munawala, meaning he gave me his notes. He gave me his notes. He handed them to me, meaning Munawala, coming from Nail. Nawala, you now will Munawala ten. Nala yanalu nailan, huh? Noel, etc. Meaning you hand someone to some, to, you hand something to someone. Did he hand you his notes and say, "Go ahead and narrate them from me," or not? Did he hand you his notes and say, "You have ijaza or not? Alhamdulillah, he gave you his notes. Thumma shafahani. Then he says he made mushafaha, which means that a person is basically. The mushafaha means like orally, orally telling someone something. Now in English, one is going to ask the question, shafaha, he orally told me, does that mean akhbarani, hadathani? It's a bit different here. Afterwards he says, thumma kataba ilayya. Then he corresponded with me, meaning he wrote me a letter. He wrote me, meaning he gave me his notes via uh, uh, mail. He sent me a letter with his hadith therein. Naam. Courier. Tayyib. He says here, Thumma an. And then comes the siga, the way or the manner of, ta- of, of getting, of al tahammul, of getting the hadith, is when it is an. Like we explained in the Bayquni and Tadhkira, an, from Fulan. Ha, Mu'a, you say, Ha, Muhammad an al Hassan. From Hassan. He doesn't say, حَدَّثَنِ Hassan, أَخْبَرَنِ Hassan, etc. Huh? He says, وَنَحْوُهَا And things like this. There are other things that are similar to these. سِيَغُ adā. These سِيَغُ adā. He says, so the first two are from those uh, f- or they to be used when someone hears from the sheikh by himself. Someone who hears from the sheikh by himself. When you say, سَمِعْتُ and حَدَّثَنِ I heard and he reported to me. Which is clear. Uh, and you actually heard from the sheikh's word, his love of his utterance himself. If he says hadathana, if he says hadathana, uh, 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 the with others, of course, other people were there. Now he says, and the first of them is the strongest and the greatest of them. Huh? It's the strongest. Mm? When a person says, Samit to, huh? Samit to, I heard. Asrahuha. It is the most frank. Is the, it, you can't have any type of cheating. He reported to us, meaning the Muslims, and I wasn't there. No, I heard means I heard directly. It's no, it's clear, right to the point. And he says, fil imla. And it's the strongest with regards to dictation. When someone heard it directly themselves. He says, and the third and the fourth are to be used for when someone is by himself reading to the sheikh. When someone is by him or herself reading to the sheikh. You say, Qara'tu. Huh? You say, Akhbarani. Wa He reported to me, made ikhbar. I read to him, etc. Uh, if there are more than, if there's more than just him there, then it is kal khamis, like the fifth one, huh? Like the fifth one, tayyib.
خير إن شاء الله تعالى. Moving forward. Uh, he says in the word imba, it is uh, the same meaning as ikhbar, according to the early scholars. As far as the later scholars, then some of them they use the word imba for ijaza. Now, before we move forward, because the author, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he mentioned this briefly, we have to understand just like any other science, there's always going to be the old school and the new school. That's life. There's always the old school and the new school. We have the young heads and the old heads. It's just how things are in every aspect of life. Medicine, doctors, physician, every aspect of life, there's the old school and there's the new school. Obviously, the old school, they have the virtue of establishing. They have the virtue of laying down the foundations and many more. And of course, when we say old school, there are levels of old school. There are generations. The very, very first they are the ones who, who laid down the crude blocks. And then another generation, they're still old school. They came and they built upon those blocks. And he made a stronger foundation. Then a third made an actual building. And then later on, as the time grew, people started to paint and decorate and furnish and etc. with the building until the later new school, the younger generation, they made an advanced, uh, uh, they made it, you know, advanced technological leaps, and which is a fine, detailed system of a thing called a house now. And it's no longer just a couple of stones, but there's all types of novelties that can be now felt in this house. And they expanded it and they made it larger and bigger and greater and grander. And now it's not longer a house, but it's an actual neighborhood. Or a city or a state. Huh? Obviously, through the sheer gap of the generations in time, let alone what was needed, what wasn't needed, there are going to be different uh, stances and different ways of looking at things. There's going to be different tastes, different opinions, different views, because they're old and we're new. They were there first, we came later. Okay, They laid down the foundation, but we expanded it. We built upon it. We carried on the legacy, we, 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 etc. So there are always going to be different differences. Some of those differences may just be on the surface between the old school and the new school. And there are certain differences which are going to be in the core, core values that the new school says, no, that was wrong, that was incorrect. Or the exact opposite. Okay, uh, a person may be from the later generations, he may be a young person, may have a quote unquote an old soul. And he says, what the young people are doing today is totally wrong. And how the old people did it, that's the right way. Okay? Or the young people in the new school, they may say, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's a new day and age. It's a new time. Things have to be done differently now. Etc. So there's no difference when it comes to the sciences of hadith. When it comes to the old school and the new school. We have the mutaqaddimun and the mutaakhirun. And we said sometimes, like many things, like in life, they're going to agree. And there's no need to change or to alter or to tweak. They're going to agree. And they're just going to continue to benefit from the old school. And there are other times in which they do change things. Intentionally or unintentionally. Things are needed. Things are aren't needed. There are going to be core differences. that. That's a very long discussion with regards to the mutaqaddimun and the mutaakhirun. Very, very long discussion with regards to that. Khairan inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, he then says, And he says here, and the an'ana, when a person says an, instead of hadathana, hadathani, akhbarani, sami'tu, this person told me, I heard from him, when he just says from. When he is a mu'asir, he's a contemporary of his sheikh. Meaning there was a possibility and a high level of probability for them to actually have met each other and him to actually have heard from him. He says then the asal, the default, is that he heard from him. That's the asal. Mahmulatun ala sama. We consider this student to have heard from this teacher because they lived in the same generation and there's no decisive strong proof stating that he didn't hear from him, i.e. what we previously explained with regards to al-mursal al-khafi. Al-Mursal Al-Khafi. Huh? We previously explained Al-Mursal Al-Khafi. So we have a Mu'asir, one who is a contemporary. 
and he reports from a scholar, a sheikh, and he doesn't say, Samit, I heard him, Hadathani, Hadathana, but he says, An, from him. Is he a contemporary? Yes, he is. Hafid bin Hajar, he says, then the default is that he did hear from him, except in the case in which this narrator, this student is one who is a mudallis, one who practices tadlis, as we have previously explained in Nukhbat Fikr and the previous two classes as well. That's one view. The second view, and this is uh, from the benefits of Nukhbat Fikr, is that even though uh, it is his ikhtiarat, his views, his selections, his reservations. Nukhbat al-Fikr is like a fiqh book, it's a madhab. This is the madhab of Ibn Hajar. This are, these are his views. What, he, what is your view, Ibn Hajar, regarding narrating from a person of innovation? That's my madhab. What is your madhab, Hafid ibn Hajar, with regards to uh, when it says, Hasanun Sahih, this is what I believe. What is your view, Hafid ibn Hajar, with regards to uh, who is a companion? What's the definition of a Sahabi? This is my madhab. Everybody understand this? So it's like, this is like you're studying the fiqh book. It is his selection. It is his selection. Uh, the selection of his views. So even though he gives you his selection, his, uh, his ikhtiyar, he also sometimes, occasionally, mixes it up just a bit with the other views as we have read and taken. We mentioned a few times when he says, waqila, waqila, waqada, waqada, waqada. Okay, so here he mentions a second view, and he says, "Waqila." Others say, "Yushtaratu thubuti liqahima." He says, "Walo maratan." Some say that it is a condition for these two people to have met and to have physically came into contact with each other. Walo maratan, even if it's just one time. Even if it's just one time, it doesn't have to be every single hadith. But at least once. He says, المختار, And this is the correct view. This here is the correct view. So once more, we have two people who are contemporaries. They live in the same time. And even more probable, they're in the same area. Whether it's one country like Iraq, or whether it's one city inside of Iraq such as Mosul. They're, ones, they're both hadith disciples. They're both people who busy themselves with hadiths. All right? The sheikh could be 65 years old, and the tilmith could be 20 years old. They're still contemporaries, meaning they're in the same generation. They're in the same age, meaning living. Obviously, the 65-year-old has 40 years on him, but we're talking about they're alive. He's a 65-year-old teacher, and he's a 20-year-old student. They're both students of hadith. They're both people who busy themselves with the art of hadith. Naam? So it's very probable that this was one of the top hadith masters in Mosul. And this is one of the most brilliant, diligent students in Mosul of hadith. It's very probable that they met. What's the chances of him being alive, him being alive, him being a teacher, him being a student in the same city and them not coming in contact with each other? Chances are very slim. They're very slim. And some ulama, they say that it's unnecessary. It's no need for it to be documented that they met. That is a ta'annut, yani. That's, that's extremism. That's too much. That's, that's pushing it too much, making things too difficult. And there are other ulama who say, no, they have to have met at least one time. Not every single hadith, but at least once that they actually came into physical contact with each other. And that's what Ibn Hajar Ta'ala says is al mukhtar He says that's the strongest view. Now, we don't want to go too deep into this. However, we can't just take this book uh, and study it in the exact same way in which we studied the other books. There has to be some type of maturity or a development with regards to the level of study. Even though uh, Nukhbat al-Fikr and al are very similar. What's important is is that this is one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the reasons why some of the people of knowledge, <clears throat> they hold the view that Sahih al-Bukhari is more authentic than Sahih Muslim. This is why, this is one of the reasons why they say that Sahih al-Bukhari is more authentic than Sahih Muslim. And they say 
that Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah's madhab, his view, his opinion, and this is very important for us to understand what is meant by the word madhab. We've explained this before. Many people, they are totally clueless about the proper understanding of the word madhab, linguistically and technically. The word madhab is a stance, is a position of an imam, what he takes in the issue of khilaf. The issue of differences of opinion, this is my stance. If someone asked you, politically, what are you? He says, I'm a Democrat. I believe, I believe then that the Democrat's way is the best way. And another says, I'm a Republican. Hmm? That is a madhab of politics. This is where I go. This is where I walk. That's the view that I take, is that the Republicans are better than the Democrats. So in fiqh and aqidah, and hadith, there are madhahib. There are different, some people they translate as schools of thought. But it's deeper than just a school of thought. It doesn't have to be a total school. It can just be one view, one opinion. Hmm? So here, Al-Hafid ibn Hajar, he says that that's the right view. And as we said, there were other great ulama who are the view that it doesn't uh, need to be documented that they met at least once. And that's why some of the ulama say that Sahih Bukhari is more authentic than Sahih Muslim. Without any disrespect to Sahih Muslim, but it's saying that it is a generally sounder book. Even though Sahih Muslim is a sound book. Okay. Khairan, inshallah. Um, Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he defends his view that they don't have to meet. It didn't have to, it, that obviously, the meeting, there has to be, he had to get the hadith from the Sheikh, but it doesn't have to be documented that they met. He defends this uh, position very vehemently and very staunchly in the Muqaddimah, the introduction to his Musnad Sahih, to Sahih Muslim. Okay, with a very, very interesting argument. Uh, and as we have explained in our uh, brief documentary on Imam Muslim's life from the masters of old, Imam Muslim Ta'ala, was said to have a very sharp temper. He was said to be very passionate, okay, about what he considered to be the truth. And in his book, uh, the introduction, which is very extremely necessary for the disciple of Hadith to read several times over and over and over again. It's one of those books that, that you have to read over and over again. That's Sahih Muslim, but we're talking about the Muqaddimah. You have to keep reading the Muqaddimah over and over again. What's important is, is that <clears throat> uh, in that Muqaddimah, uh, Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he um, he defends his position very fiercely, uh, and even so much that he claims that those who say that they have to have met, it has to be documented that they met, he even says this is yeah, I mean, close to some type of innovative statement. Uh, and this is why some of the ulama say that it was impossible for him to be talking about Imam al-Bukhari. There is no way that he could have been addressing Imam al-Bukhari with that statement because Imam al-Bukhari was his teacher. And we all know how he loved Imam al-Bukhari. Huh? What's important is, Allah knows best whether he, talk, whether he was talking about Imam al-Bukhari or not, is that he defended that view very strongly. Hmm? Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. So those are one of the reasons why they say that Sahih al-Bukhari is more authentic than Sahih Muslim. And there are other reasons as well. There are other reasons as well. We don't have the time to explain them right now. Those who have a strong appetite and are too greedy to suffice themselves with this summarized, simple elementary lesson, then there are sources and resources for them to read about this and listen to this. Okay? Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving forward. He says, واشترطوا في صحة المناولة اقترانها بالإذن بالرواية وهي أرفع أنواع الإجازة. Moving on, or يعني the, the, when he was talking about <coughs> the معاصر and the ثبوت السماع and the لقاء, that was like يعني in a, 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 a comma or between two hyphens. Now he's back to speaking about the سيغ والأداء and the إجازة and things like this. Okay, um, the word مشافها is pertaining to the ijaza that is done verbally or orally, like we explained, that we would it would become clearer, inshallah ta'ala. An ijaza that's done orally or verbally, 
It's not written down, but he actually says, Qad ajaztuka. I've given you ijaz to take these hadiths. It'll be ha'ani and narrate them from me. Uh, and he mentioned al mukataba, the mutual correspondence, when a person gives ijaz and he wrote it to him. I'm in a country, you're in a country, I write you ijaz for you to take the hadith and report it from me. Now, before we move forward, when we say ijaz, we are not talking about uh, the. It, it's very similar to the Quranic ijaz today. A person has ijaz. But it's sometimes a bit different. Whereas the Quranic ijazah, a person has an isnad that goes to the Prophet wasallam, And oftentimes this is a means of permission or allowance. Or not even that, but just a, a mafkhara. A means of fame and fortune. Hmm? And sometimes showing off and boasting because a person has the isnad. So they say this person is a Quran teacher and he can be a Quran teacher. He can work at the masjid, he's the imam, he's going to get paid, he's going to get married because he has ijazah. Or this sister can now teach because she has an ijazah in the Qur'an, even though she's not the best Qur'an teacher. Her recitation isn't the best, her memory isn't the best. There's someone else who has a better recitation, better memory, but doesn't have an ijazah. That's problematic, obviously. Uh, or the word ijazah can mean just a permission or a license to teach, like a student. Uh, a student studied this book with me, and at the end of me teaching the student the book, the student takes an exam. I evaluate the student. He passes the exam. I says, you can teach the book. Meaning, you don't have to narrate it from me, but if anyone comes to me saying, what about Funan? I says, yes, that's my student, and he's proficient in this science and that science. He can teach this, and he can teach that. A recommendation, a scientific recommendation. Khayr, inshallah. So, well, the ijazah has different meanings. The word ijazah has different meanings. We'll stop here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.